much. Um, you will notice that behind me, there's an empty space. Choir rehearsal starts Wednesday. Maybe you've never been in the choir before. Wednesday, 6 p.m., back there. Join them. And on a more serious note, I would ask you today, um, last week there was a lot of, lot of prayer requests, a lot of things going on with people. Uh, we need to continue to pray for the members of our church that are struggling with their health and issues. And today I would ask you specifically to pray for Hank and Kathy Leonard's granddaughter, Chelsea. Chelsea uh, is a young mom with a two-year-old and an eight-month-old. She's very critically ill this morning. And I would invite you to pray for her today, for her strength and for her healing. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty, a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way that you came and travel the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram and then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel and anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel-Meholah to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elijah. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. May God bless us today with the reading of this word. Well, a few years ago, uh, Teresa, by the way, let me... For, for, we were married 28 years ago yesterday, so that was exciting for us. Um, and uh, I'm grateful every day that she said yes and love her with all my heart. So I'm so happy about that. But yeah, so, but we've had our struggles like others. And she became concerned about my hearing. And so enough to the point to where we reached out to an audiologist who was a member of the church to get her to check my hearing. She said, David, he, he seems to be having some hearing loss. And so we contacted the audiologist and she made an appointment with us and she brought all her equipment to the church office, set it up in my office, her equipment, and Teresa was there, I'm there, we're sitting at a table, they put these headphones on me and they began, she began to test my hearing with these low frequencies and I pushed a button every time I heard the noise. 45 minutes, I think, was the test. Uh, she printed a graph, 
And then she gave us the results. David doesn't have any problem with his hearing. In fact, David has exceptional hearing. And Teresa, Teresa, I can't even make this up, honestly. Teresa looks at her and says, well, what's the problem then? She gets this big smile on her face and then smirks and says, David's just not listening. (laughs) He has selective hearing. Raise your hand if you're married to someone with selective hearing. Okay. Well, we actually had this conversation yesterday. Are you listening? I mean, you don't want um, your pastor to tell you that he's a terrible listener, but it's true. It's not that I don't want to listen. It's just, well, it's the way my brain is wired. I don't live in the real world. I mean, my brain is kind of a dreamy brain. It's an active brain. It's an ADH brain. I'm running laps in my brain all the time. And it's not that I don't want to listen. It's just, it's hard for me to be still in my brain long enough to focus and to listen. That's why you'll never have a conversation with me after church that lasts more than three seconds. Because my brain is always running around. And I generally try really hard to listen. A few years ago, uh, a sweet woman in our church came up to me, an older woman, and put her hands on my cheeks like this, and she got close to my face, and she said, David, just be still for a moment. I want you to listen. And it's been a problem when I pray, too. And I I appreciated her doing that. Since that moment, it's something I sometimes visualize when I do pray. When I do pray and I'm trying to get quiet and I'm trying to be still, sometimes I imagine God taking me and putting his hands gently on my face and saying to me, just be still for a minute. Will you just listen? Now you've gathered by now from the scripture I just read that this is a story about listening to God in the silence. We've been walking with Elijah for six weeks now. And now God wants him to listen. Uh, We've been walking with him for six weeks. And we've been with him through these highs and lows. And we have witnessed all his impressive qualities. Elijah is a man of courage and conviction and faith. You remember that Elijah came on the scene during the 9th century B.C. during the reign of King Ahab when Ahab and his wife Jezebel led the people away from God and turned toward the false god Baal to worship. Jezebel was a Phoenician and she worshipped, and she was a devoted fanatical worshiper of the god Baal. And she had 450 prophets of Baal who ate at her table and who responded to her commands. They had systematically ordered the death and the slaughter of all the prophets of God and anyone who bowed down to God that they could get their hands on. But Elijah stood up to them at every turn, defied them and frustrated them. And as we learned just a little time ago, that he went up on Mount Carmel and put it all to the test. And there, after a 30-second prayer, God answered him and responded to him decisively and kept called down, brought down fire from heaven and burned up the altar. And the people fell to their knees to worship the one true God. It was a great moment. But that's not where we left him last week. Last week, we did not leave him on the mountaintop. Last week, we left left him down in the valley, and he was discouraged and depressed because nothing had turned out the way he wanted them to turn out. In fact, things got worse. Jezebel did not repent. Ahab did not repent. They did not return to God. In fact, Jezebel doubled down and put a contract on his life and threatened to kill him. And he ran. 
ran a hundred miles to the south, found a little bush out in the desert, and laid down under the bush and said, God, I just want to die. I'm done. He had all the classic signs of depression, uh, exhaustion, fatigue, feelings of worthlessness and shame and guilt. He was lonely and isolated. He had lost perspective, and he was suicidal in his thinking. And he had completely lost hope. What I love about that story is what God does, though. What does God do in that moment? God doesn't scold him or command him or condemn him. What does God do in that moment? God is tender toward him. God bakes him a cake. I love that. It shows us so much about the character of God in that moment. And what it reminds us of is this underlying truth that you'll find present in the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, that God is transcendent and holy other but yet God is still tender and will still touch because God's not like many Christians many Christians who believe that if you are depressed or discouraged that you just lack faith you know who want to give you a sermon give you a lecture give you a cliche read the Bible from you talk about what's wrong with you give you suggestions give you advice but the reality is when someone is depressed they don't need advice they don't need a lecture They just need a hug and someone to hold their hand and someone to meet a need. So the next time you're around someone that's discouraged and depressed, put down your Bible and shut your big mouth. (laughs) And just bake some bread, banana nut bread, and make some mac and cheese. Mac and cheese is good for the soul. But I underline this right here. It's worth repeating. That when you're discouraged, and when you're depressed, and when you're down, God is not mad at you. God is not angry at you. God loves you and wants to put his arms around you to care for you and to love you because God is transcendent and God is is tender. So strengthened by the touch of God and strengthened by the bread that God had made for him and the cake he had made, and strengthened and renewed by the rest, the Bible says that Elijah got up and walked 40 days across the desert. Now, 40 is a big number in the Bible. You know that, right? If you read the Bible, you know 40 happens a lot. You know, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. When Noah was on the boat, when God flooded the earth, how the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Moses was on the mountain with, the, with God to get the word of God. For 40 days and 40 nights, he was on the mountain. You know, when the Israelites spied out the promised land, they were in the promised land wandering around and researching it for 40 days and 40 nights. Goliath taunted God's people in the Valley of Elah for 40 days and 40 nights while while David was coming to slay him. Uh, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights after his baptism. And you know, it was 40 days and 40 nights between the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus. I've been wondering, why is that? Why is 40 important? I don't really know the answer to that, but knowing how my brain works, it sometimes takes 40 days for God to get through to me. And it may just be that there are times in our life where we have to have an extended period of time and space for God to speak to us. Maybe it's not 40 days, but an extended period of time where we focus and listen and get quiet and everything is stripped away so that we can hear from God. Because we live in a noisy world, don't we? I mean, I get in the car and what do I do? Turn on the radio. Welcome in the house. Turn on the TV. And did you know that your your grandkids have evolved to a whole other species of human being? That when they were born out of the birth canal, they came with earbuds implanted in their head. (laughs) 
And so we need this space, this time. That's why we have Lent. Lent's a 40-day period every season before Easter for us to tune out the world, tune into God, turn things down, and to just listen. And so it says that God took him to, to Mount Horeb or to Mount Sinai. Depends on what Bible you're reading. It's the same place. But this is a significant place where God has taken him because God wants to do something in him. Mount Sinai was the mountain where uh, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on the mountain. It was the place where God gave Moses the information for the formation of God's people and where now God is going to work on Elijah and give him what he needs for his restoration so he could lead Israel through a reformation. So he goes there to that special place. And again, I want to underline this, just like the 40 days, the need to have a special place. You'll notice in the Bible, and frequently in the Bible, that God sends people to special places to speak to them. And because we live in such a noisy, busy world, if we want to hear from God, we need to find a special place. Maybe that special place is some place in your house where you can begin your day just to be quiet. I would say this room is a special place to come once a week on Sunday morning to hear from God. And maybe sometimes you need to go away to some special place and just turn things down to be able to listen to God. Let me just say this. Some of you this morning, you may be stuck and stagnant in your life, and you need to get away and to just listen. You may be in a transition in your life. You may may be in an in-between place in your life. But God wants to speak to you. And so take the time away to go away and to just be quiet. Let go of your expectations. Find a special place and just listen. So it says in the story that Elijah went into the cave. Some translations say the cave, meaning the cave where Moses went, where he hid while God passed by. He goes in the cave and he spends the night there. And then the word of the Lord comes to him and says this, asks this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Let me say it one more time. What are you doing here, Elijah? And it's a great question that has a couple of meanings. The first thing is, it's, it's that Elijah's not in the right place. Because if you read the story of Elijah again from the beginning to the end, you'll notice that God is always directing Elijah. In the beginning of the story, God directs him and guides him to go to the desert, to the brook, where he can drink from the brook and be fed by the ravens. He directs him to go to the widow of Zarephath, where she can feed him. He directs him to Mount Carmel. And then you get to uh, chapter 19, verse 3, and then he runs out in the wilderness to go to the shrub, and it's the first time in the story that God's not directing him. What's directing him? His fear. So God's saying, what are you doing out here? Why are you out here? This is not where you're supposed to be. He's not saying it to scold him. He's asking him. You know, what's the end? Why are you here? Why are you afraid? And I think, it, I think it, it's a great question for you at any time in your life to hear these words directed to you. In this moment in your life, are you where God wants you? Are you right now walking in God's will and purpose for your life? Or are you just living in fear? I mean, because don't you know that God has a plan and a purpose for you? Not just for the world, not just for the church, but that God has a plan and purpose for you. You are not the happenstance or coincidental collision of a sperm and an egg. You're not just the fastest swimmer. God created you with a purpose. That's what it says in Psalm 139. Psalm 139 says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. 
You watched me as I was being formed in the utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out. That's the second part of this question. It's asking this question, what are you doing here? Meaning, with your life. If God created you and made you and and gave you a purpose for your life, what are you doing here? Not just getting up every day and being a physical body, but living life, what are you doing here? In your family, what are you doing here? In your work, what are you doing here? In this community, what are you doing here? It's the question I ask. What am I doing here in Tulsa? (laughs) No, I ask that. Every day I get up, I try to ask that question. What is it that I'm supposed to be doing here with the time that God has for me? And you know, when I write a sermon, I'm not just trying to write a sermon you know, to check a box or to give you some information or to entertain you. I always approach it from from the same point of view. I'll write it on the top of the paper. What does God want me to say? What is the message for our people? What am I doing here? And then I listen and struggle and wrestle to bring a message to you here. So it says that then, he says, walk out, I'm about to pass by. And there's a big windstorm, and it says that the rocks broke, but God wasn't in the wind. Then it said there was an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, but God wasn't in the fire. Now God sometimes in the Bible shows up in those ways, shows up in those ways in Elijah's story. But not in this moment. God is not in any of those dramatic displays of power. It says, after the wind and after the fire and after the earth shook, a gentle whisper. Do you wonder what God might have said to him? I wonder. It doesn't say. But I think it was something like this. I think that he was just reassuring him. Hey, I know you're not where you're supposed to be, but you need to know I'm never going to give up on you. Elijah, I chose you, and I want you to have confidence in your calling. I chose you, and I love you, and I'll always love you, and I'll never give up on you. Trust me. I trust you. I believe in you. I I think that's the voice that sometimes we hear if we get quiet because we live in a world where we feel so much insecurity and so much fear and we live out of fear, we live out of insecurity and when we get quiet, we can hear that voice, that gentle whisper. I think that Jesus heard in the wilderness, you're my beloved, I love you. I, I hope that you can hear that voice that you can get quiet enough and still enough to hear God say to you, I love you. I know I need to say this to you right now. There's someone here today who needs me to hear, needs to hear me say to you, God loves you. God knows you. God cares about you. The gentle whisper. You know, so, you know, for me, uh, a personal story, uh, and you've heard this before, but Teresa and I moved here at the beginning of 2020 during the pandemic, and uh, the first Sunday was Palm Sunday, and it was, there were only two people in the room, Dylan Ford and me, a camera, myself, and Kelly Ford. We were the only ones in the room. And I thought the, you know, it would be like that for two or three weeks. I thought we'd be back by Easter. Didn't happen that way. Nothing, nothing turned out like I planned or expected. None of nothing. And I remember thinking, what am I going to do? How do I do this? I mean, everybody loves Mark Briley, the, the former pastor. How do you follow a popular pl- pastor when there's no one here? 
They don't know you. Are they going to still give money to support the ministry of the church? When the pandemic is over, will they keep coming? Will they come back? All the tools that were given to me to lead a church were taken away. All the stuff that I do, which is personal, in-person contact with people, was taken away. And it was just a lot of long, quiet days. And I spent a lot of time in here by myself, sitting by that stained glass window in the afternoons, just reading my Bible and being quiet. And then one day, quietly, as I was searching and honestly feeling somewhat desperate, I heard a gentle whisper. A few days later, I was out running and by myself on the river early in the morning before daylight, and then I heard it again. I heard the same phrase, the same words, a gentle whisper. And then early in the morning, a few days later, and I've heard this gentle whisper. I heard it over and over again. This one morning I heard the same gentle whisper, and I wrote it down in my journal. I can go back and find it. I could show it to you. I wrote it in my journal, and it was like this. It says, David, here's what I need you to do. Just do what I've always asked you to do. Live in love like Jesus. And you'll be fine. And we say that a lot around here, but I want to tell you, that's not a marketing phrase. It's not a strategy to build a church. Nothing like that. Where does that come from that we started saying this weeks ago? It just came because I was sitting alone and I was desperate and got quiet. And I heard inside me, it all comes down to just living and loving like Jesus. If you will do that, you'll be okay because that's all I've ever wanted you to do. It's true. That's all we're ever called to do. And that phrase gave me courage and gave me confidence. And then as I was searching for where we would lead our church on the other side of the pandemic, it became the anchoring words that would guide us forward to what's next for our church. To call people to be people of compassion and love in a divided world and to be that church that will just be known for being people who live and love like Jesus. I know what some of you may be thinking. David, I don't know how to hear from God. I don't know how to listen. This is true. I know this is true. You have to want to hear from God. You have to want to listen. You have to cultivate a desire to hear. And so it begins down deep inside your heart, inside of you. It comes out of a place of desperation where you're saying, you know, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what direction is next. I need your help and I, I want to hear from you, I want to hear from you, I need to hear from you, and help, give me a desire, give me a desire inside of me for you, put that desire for me, in me, for you. And then turning stuff down, and turning stuff off, and listening, and not one time, but for days and days and days. And just imagining God putting God's hands on your face and saying, would you just be still and listen 